live here today for Reset 2020 and you can see all the beautiful people that we have on screen here today talking about events in the new world. Um, not only do we have people but we have a special four-legged uh, little friend here. Um, a very big welcome to you kind sir and a very big welcome to you Charlie as well from Guide Dogs Australia. This, I'd like to introduce you to Charlie Spendlove who's the Head of Marketing and Communications for Guide Dogs Victoria, New South Wales and ACT. Thank you, Charlie, for coming on the show with us today. My pleasure. Um, and hello to everyone out there listening. Great. Fantastic presentation, Lily. It was really great to see. Yes, she puts a lot of effort in and, and leaves people with a lot of inspiring ideas, that's for sure. Now, Charlie, we're here to talk about um, a big pivot for Guide Dogs Australia. Everyone's been um, pivoting around um, the last couple of months and an absolute standout um, of, uh, for International Guide Dogs Day of you being able to work out how to, how to pivot that online. We, we do have a beautiful video to show everyone in just a minute, but Charlie, can you tell us pre-COVID and pre-pandemic over the years, what has International Guide Dogs looked like in its physical sense? Mm -hmm. Look, International Guide Dog Day um, is international. We can't move the date. So um, uh, when COVID hit, you know, we really did have to think on our feet. But traditionally, we would be running um, a number of events that celebrate, I guess, the great work that guide dogs do in the community in supporting a person with low vision and blindness to independence. But also, it's a time for us to connect with um, key individuals and organisations and provide them with uh, the honour of an award for their service, um, uh, I guess, to inclusion and accessibility. So it's, it's a critical time. I guess it's the biggest day in our calendar around the whole country and around the world in the guide dogs community. So um, it's certainly, we, it, it certainly had a series of physical events that involved both our clients, volunteers, sponsors, partners, etc. Yeah, great, fantastic. And um, I didn't get a chance for you to introduce your- oh, oh. I'll see if I can- pick little it friend there, oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is, um, this is Max. Um, he'll probably sit up again in a minute. Um, I, I may have a, it may seem like I have a really glamorous job, but I'm literally sitting in a dog bed right now. Uh, it's Max's dog bed, and Max is, in fact, one of our ambassador dogs. So he's in my marketing team, and he would be normally attending all the events to welcome people as they come in. So um, it's really nice to have him, and he has no idea about social distancing. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Max, and welcome to the show. You're an international star. We love having you here. Gorgeous. <laughs> Yeah, now, we, yeah. we're very fortunate today, and thank you, Charlie, for organising this for today. Um, we've got a short video to show you um, exactly uh, some highlights from International Guide Dogs Day going online. So we're going to share that now, and then we're going to hear more from Charlie about, um, you know, what, what were the key ingredients, what made it a success, and some other great takeaways for you to take back to your workplace today. So let's pop into that video now. Go into share and off we go. International Guide Dogs. There you go. Nothing like a technical hiccup, is there? <laughs> Let's try that again. All right. We're having a technical problem there with the video. I'm not sure why that's not playing. It's always the way, isn't it? You can play things a thousand times in the background. Let's just check there for a moment. Now, actually, Charlie, while we're just checking in on the video, would you like to, um, to share with us, let me just jump over here for a second. Um, in your events, including this one, um, is, is fundraising a priority? I know fundraising has come up a lot in our mm. questions. Um, and how did you implement the fundraising objective if it is um, into, into this, um, event uh, with it being virtual? Look, um, traditionally, uh, International Guide Day is not a day around fundraising. It is principally a day around advocacy for the people that we support who handle guide dogs every day. Uh, we also focus, of course, on brand awareness. Um, but that's not to say that we don't always have fundraising at the back of our mind because we are highly reliant on very generous donors that support the work that we do. 
Um, across the country, uh, our average level of, I guess, funding is, is still around that 20 to 30% if we're lucky. So 70% of all our revenue is directly uh, reliant on fundraising, like so many other charities. So look, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't try to engage with those new audiences that we secured through this event, and we certainly did. But I think what's really important, I think Lily touched on this before, is if you're going to create a really authentic, wholesome event, don't, um, don't stuff it up at the other end by putting in a really hard ask. It should be about really educating, engaging and connecting with your audiences first and foremost, and then take them on the journey so that they can see the impact of your work. So for us, that was very much uh, how, we, how we, I guess, approach this particular test. And it was a test. Uh, there was so many things that we've learned and we're doing it all again this Friday for National Volunteers Week. And you know, you'll see a few changes um, from our initial learnings. But to answer your question, look, we did have um, uh, some strong leads that came out of the event and we obviously contacted those people thereafter and, and taking them on the journey to get to know our wonderful brand and of course our beautiful dogs like, like Max. <laughs> Gorgeous, fantastic. We are going to try that video um, again now. Thank you very much for your patience, everybody, and thank you, Charlie, for your patience. Um, Jackie, can you try that from your end, please? You'll just need to share that. Great. Let's give that a go. International Guide Dog Day is a chance to celebrate the difference our hardworking pups make for people who are blind or living with low vision. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19 restrictions, the events we had planned this year were put on hold. So we regrouped with our PR partner, Keep Left, and realised we had an opportunity to give the Australian public a much needed boost while raising awareness of the work we do. That opportunity, a newborn guide dog, and his name is, wait for it, Zoom. With the Zoom video conferencing platform leading as the most popular tool for connecting during lockdown, we had the perfect idea introduce the public to Zoom on Zoom and bring International Guide Dog Day to our audience virtually. You're wondering what's going on. We're here to celebrate International Guide Dog Day by saying hello to some of our charming guide dogs along the way in their journey. Zoom the platform came on as a partner for the virtual event and Zoom the puppy put on his smudgiest face. Using guide dog staff as spokespeople, our audience saw all our panelists and their dogs for a serious cuteness overload. Not surprisingly, the idea and the team of hardworking Labradors took the media by storm. It is International Guide Dog Day and we've got a puppy party happening later today. I'm gonna to give you all the details because guess what? You're all invited. This International Day of Recognition saw experts pause for a special online meeting. Have a look at these pictures of the Zoom party that will be taking place at midday. Click on the link on the Facebook page. Also, for the very first time, we are going to meet Zoom. <laughs> it's a dog, isn't it? I don't know if humans are allowed at the doggy Zoom party. I mean, I don't know what the rules are around that. But it wasn't all fair and games. Puppy Zoom gave us the chance to increase awareness of people living with blindness or low vision and create a new appreciation for their everyday heroes. Thanks to the close collaboration of teams throughout our organisation and across state borders, we defied the odds, making this year one of our most successful celebrations of International Guide Dog Day. <laughs> Beautiful. Guide Dog Day is a chance to celebrate. Oh, it's going again. It wants to just keep playing now that it's working. <laughs> that is indeed um, cuteness overload there. And one of the things that um, you've all picked up on so far and, and that you've mentioned there as well, Charlie, was around, was around data. And you actually show a lot of the data that was captured there. Can you perhaps speak briefly to that? And we actually have a poll here as well, just to ask people if they're actually capturing data um, in their in their events. What what did you find Charlie with that? Look, uh, we are absolutely a data-driven organization. We're fully committed to, to that evidence-based decision making. So for, for me, digital is a no-brainer because I have you know such granular oversight of I guess people's engagement levels, their behaviors, and obviously around our audiences. So for me, um, I guess uh, it's it's something that we do um, whether there's a C19 epidemic or not. So we're definitely uh, embarking on some, some serious investment, I guess, in our social and, and developing some new strategies at the moment. 
Yeah, great. What, what were for you some of the key data points that you wanted to capture just to help? Well, you? Yeah. Yeah, I guess for us, what was really important was to see if we could engage with some new audiences. We have a strong following already on social across the country. And, you know, generally they are the um, dog loving public. And so our job is to, I guess, uh, utilize their love of dogs to actually then educate and build their literacy around the, the work we do for humans. And so for me, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at, am I actually driving new audiences, younger audiences um, to our brand? Our brand is, you know, Australia's most trusted brand. It's iconic. Um, and, you know, everybody, doesn't matter what age you are, will remember running at the end of a boring supermarket trip to put that coin in the collection dogs. So the journey with giving starts very, very young with our brand. But there is a gap that we were trying to reach and to re-engage, I guess, with people who were in isolation. You know, isolation is is in fact the norm for many of the people that we support. So we're experts in understanding connection. And so that that's what we were looking to do in terms of our data is is to drive new audiences and to engage with them and then to take them on that journey. That's great. Looking at the video there, I think everyone can and would say that that's a, that's a massive success as an event. But look, looking at your objectives with the event and how you define success, can you tell us, was the event a success from your perspective? And if, if so, what were those success indicators? Oh, look, for me, it was a, it was a huge success. And, and for me, I, when I'm looking at um, the indicators uh, that will drive whether we'll develop that idea further was really around benchmarking against a physical event. Um, we'd, we'd never done a vir virtual event before. And to be honest, the virtual event had a far greater reach than a physical event would ever have had. Plus, we could measure the outcome. So I don't think um, my caveat to that is I don't think that physical events should ever end. It is very much what um, Lily was saying is around the hybrid, but you can do a lot more personalization. And so, yeah, for me, it was really about the reach. Um, we have a very strong uh, relationship with our uh, partner uh, agency, Keep Left, um, who manage our public relations. And, you know, the more you hear about this idea, the more I would advise people to really stop thinking transactionally about their suppliers and to, to really work as one team. And so for us, the success was around, I guess, beating our target around reach. My, my annual target for media reach um, is around that 100 million. And last year we did 180 million. So for us to achieve 90 million in reach, to have 4,000 people interested in our event, 2,100 people turn up. And I think in one state alone, we had 50 leads that came out of it. So, you know, it was, I can't tell you how much my heart was in my mouth when we were a minute to going live, but, uh, uh, and I couldn't wait for it to end just so I could relax, but it was just incredible. The people, people were engaged for the entire 20 minutes. And that's what we learned that you don't have to have such slick content. It has to be authentic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a nice, that's a nice point to, to um, go into our next, um, our next point that we want to talk about those magic ingredients. Like sometimes it's just something really simple and we saw that with Lil's examples before with the beanie and just capitalising on those, the simplicity of things. Could you perhaps share on this and then we want to hear from Liliana as well. What do you think were those sort of magic ingredients in terms of putting them together that, that it really did pop um, for people in, engaging in a virtual way with you? Mm. Look, before I get to the obvious ones, I am going to say first up, you, I have a fearless and bright team. So if you want to think outside the box and you've been running a hierarchical structure where you decide what's going to be next and you're putting pressure on them to come up with ideas, they will never come up with ideas and they'll never have the courage to try new things. So when I look at this particular project, it, it was like a perfect football game with the ball being passed, you know, up and down the pitch and you know right right into that goal so i would say one magic ingredient for me and i live this every day is having the support of just an incredibly talented team that i trust and respect so i really encourage people to put the power back into your specialist teams rather than think you can do it yourself but i guess over and above that what um, i think you always have to have um, is great content and great talent and of course, we had the most beautiful uh, little puppy called Zoom. And 
for those of you who don't realize this, it's very, very unusual for us to have a singleton. Normally our litters are about five to seven puppies. So when a singleton is born, it's kind of like a big thing. So it goes through the, the community very quickly because those singletons, um, they don't know that they're a dog because they spend so much time with humans. So they're usually very, very friendly and you know, incredible on camera. So as soon as I heard there was this puppy, I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. This is my next superstar. And um, he was super, super cute. And so the decision to call him Zoom was absolutely a strategic one. So we had great content. Um, we've also got incredible staff. I mean, to be able to support people to independence, both babies, uh, you know, teens, and of course the adults that everybody um, typically thinks of that the people we serve. Um, I just looked for the most engaging talent I could to, I guess, present. And we had the fantastic Ryan. He's a guide dog mobility instructor up in New South Wales. I think he kind of got almost as much engagement as Zoom the puppy did. He's quite <laughs> easy on the eye. I hope he doesn't mind me saying that, but he's also a great presenter and he knows his stuff. So um, we had lots of lots of, I guess, uh, engagement with him. So you need to have content that's not a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And don't always think about hierarchy as well. If, if you normally would pick your most senior person, don't do that. Pick the person who's gonna engage the most. I'm super blessed because I, I have, well, I have two bosses. I don't know if that's a blessing or not, but both of them are incredible public speakers. So I, I did use them on this occasion, but I don't think that's a given. And then I guess number two, I would say would be around promotion. So you really need to think about promoting your event and take the time to do it. We invested in that with our partner, Keep Left. They know, they know exactly all the levers to pull with the different media outlets. Um, so that you do, you build that rising excitement and, and keep it going. Don't think about just one asset to promote. Think about the lead up to your event to keep that, I guess, excitement and suspense going. It's lots of teasers. And then uh, the last thing I would say is just test, 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 rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. You need to have tech support. You've got great tech support on here today. You need to know it's going to work. You've got to check the lighting. You've got to practice people. Um, and look, we were working with dogs. We had six dogs on camera and they never do what you expect them to do. <laughs> Sometimes it's like liquid gold, but uh, that, that's always my worry. And we also had, you know, people with low vision blindness. So making sure they feel included and, and supported. So yeah, my, I guess great, a great team. Um, make sure you promote, have amazing content that's reliable. And yeah, keep testing it until the last second. <laughs> They're really great tips there. They're really great tips. I've just gone to full gallery view so everyone on the recording after this can see everyone's beautiful faces here. Um, top left, Julie Weldon, communications specialist from the X Factor Collective. And uh, bottom left is uh, Liliana Senali uh, from Perfect Events and a specialist within the X Factor Collective as well. Um, Julie and Lil, at this point in time, um, reflecting on this great project, I thought I might just throw to you and just from your um, perspective on this incredible achievement for International Guide Dogs Day. Um, Lil, I'll start with you and then over to you, Julie, just to get a couple of comments on, from your perspective, what are some of the real takeouts here for organisations to take? And I know that you'll um, take slightly different um, views on this. Lil, from your ex experience, um, you've run over 900 um, events across Australia and around the world. What do you think the key takeouts here are for organisations to, to take into, into their work after today? Oh, the one, one of the biggest thing, and, um, and I've worked with Charlie for many, many years, and I think this is why we resonate so well, is keeping it real. I think a lot of not-for-profits get a lot of pressure from above their board, their stakeholders who aren't living what the, the staff are working to make a difference in this world. So being heart-centred approach, that real authenticity is what people are craving at the moment. And if you're making your virtual event or your hybrid event around being real and that ask, and if anything, and when I was speaking to Fight MND, they said one of the things that they had to even communicate with is that we might not be able to give enough money to the researchers at the moment, but we're going to let our donors and our stakeholders and everyone know that we're still trying, we're still giving it a hundred percent and we're changing what we're doing and we're working with the current environment. That's what we can do. 
similar to what Guide Dogs has done, but we might not be able at the moment to do what we've done in the past. And I think that's what's important. We put too much pressure on being too much in vers versus being real and keeping it strategic and with that re really clear message. So that, yeah, I think that's really important at the moment. Yeah, beautiful. Julie, from your perspective? Charlie, I think you stole most of what I was going to say because you picked up on all the key points that I would reiterate. For anyone that's actually running an event, you really need to plan it. You need to rehearse about it. Um, I phrase it as content is king. You've actually got to have something that people care about and that they want to come and listen to. The other thing I think Guide Dogs always does is be really consistent and authentic to your brand. Yeah. Uh, it's it's evolving as as um, as people are evolving and, and as our world is evolving. And I think what you've done with this particular project is another fantastic example about that. Um, I've had the privilege of talking to you directly about this project. So I also know that you've got really strong structured follow-up communications, just as strong as you talked about the lead-up communications being important, um, but that follow-up communication. And I know that you're, you know, you're planning on leveraging that through and I think there, there's some key lessons for people to take away from any kind of event. It doesn't really matter whether it's a, an awareness building event like this particular one was, or whether it's much more of a pure fundraising focus. Those same kind of principles apply all the way through it as part of your overarching integrated communication plan. It's a great job, fantastic case study. Thank you. Can I just add one more thing? Because I'm conscious that there's probably a few event managers listening. And there's probably a few managers listening to and there's two points I want to make your event managers are project managers. So don't if, if you've sidelined your physical events right now, you need to think about them and as their amazing all round resource that they are. And I guess the second thing with any event and this one was no different is your team is looking to you for reinforcement in a positive way. 98% of what they do will be amazing. And 2%, you know, you stuff up. So don't pick the 2%. Go, you've done an amazing job. And let them try new things because through trial, you get these, you know, you get these amazing results. So I really encourage that a bit of more kindness in this space because it is cutthroat. Mm -hmm. and, and I've seen it myself. And I think, um, I think event, event people do an amazing job. Yeah, fantastic. Um, just before, Charlie, in our first live poll, we asked people what some of their challenges were that they were experiencing. And one of the big ones that came through, 25% of people on the show here today, um, said that internal pressure to cut events um, was a big one. And one of the things I wanted to pick up now was, you know, many organisations cancelled their events. There was a lot around whether to postpone or not or cancel and, and, and this space. Um, can you tell us a bit around, you know, fr from your perspective and also Julie and Lil, if we can hear from you as well, your perspective on this. Um, how did your community react, your community, I guess, internally and then externally about taking it virtual? Um, and what would be your reflections on that where organisations are getting pressure internally from other decision makers and budget cuts um, to cancel events? I look from our perspective, um, when this all hit, of course, our number one focus, because we are very much around trust and care, was around making sure our staff was safe and getting our clients connected. And so when we started to look at events, because April was, is our biggest event month, in fact, March and April is, is huge. <clears throat> so um, we didn't have time to really think, we had to immediately turn them virtual. And because many of our supporters are so loyal and our clients are so tech savvy they you know they're olympic standard siri users uh it was quite easy for us to transition to that virtual event now to your point around cutting events of course physical events aren't going to be possible right now i mean we're already starting to plan particular options around i guess personalizing events having smaller events having clusters events having cells connected through live streams we're looking at that long term but ultimately, I think that, you know, I spoke to my event manager just the other day, I think we'll actually hold more events next this coming year because we are seeing that real need for people to connect mm -hmm. and actually creating lovely, intimate communities and being able to personalize the event is so easy to do across this medium. So I actually think for us, you know, our, our history of running amazing events and, you know, we've worked with, with perfect events many times over the years, I think we'll continue. 
and you know, I'm, I'm excited to see what they do next. I can't imagine we'll, we'll always hit the jackpot, but we're, you know, we're like our dogs. We are completely focused on the horizon. We don't get distracted. Um, and we just try and, I guess, get to the destination, whichever way we can. Yeah, great, great. And I'm just having a look over at the Q&A at the moment there as well. Um, Rise Above and Jackie and HNQ, we will get to your questions shortly and answer those. Actually, one of the questions I think we could probably interweave here shortly, which is around what we're seeing in terms of people, what sort of are the biggest mistakes that people are making with events at the moment. So we can probably get some perspective on that from everyone here as we move across into your question shortly. If you do have a question, we're gonna be still here live for another uh, 20 minutes or so. Please pop a question in the Q&A. Um, it's a great opportunity while you've got such incredible uh, people here today to ask questions of. Um, just coming back to that point, Julie, you work with a lot of boards um, as well where sometimes these decisions are, are made. Um, what would be your reflections on this space around um, events being cut out of the picture um, and, and sort of, you know, some teams having their hands held behind their backs a little bit? I think sometimes leaders and, and indeed directors of organisations, depending on how um, hands-on those, those directors are, mm. it's often what they don't know. It's the unknown factor that they don't actually have the confidence or realise that there are actually tools out there and processes and, and options actually to do some engagement. And, you know, I, I know some people are kind of grappling uh, it with how to actually run events and how to actually connect with their stakeholders. Because I think it's also important to remember that you're not only necessarily talking about the fundraising, but you're also talking about engaging with your volunteers. Uh, you're talking potentially about engaging with your staff. Uh, all of my team, for example, is now working remotely. So we've had to rethink a little bit about how we engage. Uh, so I think it's also about not being afraid to actually put it out there and ask for help and ask for that advice about how can I actually do it? You know, there are lots of tools that will allow you to have hundreds of stakeholders, uh, hundreds of participants uh, involved in, in, an, in a kind of a session from a brainstorm right through to an information sharing, right through to a team building kind of environment. There is software out there that's actually not too scary. Um, so one of the case studies that I was going to share earlier was around a, a project that's kicking off as a community development project. And initially the first thinking was that it was actually going to have to go completely on hold because how can you actually go into a whole bunch of small country towns and have these face-to-face -face meetings with people that you would normally sit down and do over a coffee in the local bakery to understand what the issues are and what areas they need support on. Our, uh, one of my clients rethought it completely, harnessed the power of Zoom yet again, uh, and taught themselves how to work out how to use breakout rooms and how to have those chat conversations for some of the big organisations that um, may, may well use these kinds of tools day in, day out. That's just a given that you know that that kind of technology is there. But there are tens of thousands of small charities and not-for-profits in Australia that are very, very small. If they have any full-time staff, um, that they're kind of, you know, very, very lucky. So being able to actually connect and, and understand that there is that kind of capability and it's actually not that scary. Uh, I sat in and helped them co-facilitate one of the breakout rooms and, you know, there were people there well into their 70s, 80s, even I suspect there was a, a very spry looking 90 year old there as well. But people uh, just need a little bit of coaching and support but be smart about the channels and the tools that you use. Most people are on Facebook or at least have a, a family member that's on Facebook. Facebook, for example, now has those, that kind of facility to be able to engage. So there's lots of different options uh, that, you know, that you can think about. Uh, and so kind of bringing it back to your original question, I think it's also about, to Charlie's point, you've got professionals there, trust them in their expertise and their knowledge. And even if they don't have the answer, they're pretty resourceful and they'll figure out some options for you. And if you don't have those staff, there's lots of Facebook groups uh, out there or come to the collective. We don't mind answering the odd question here and there because we, you know, we really want people to be able to continue to maintain that connection that um, Lily talked about that's so important and really is ultimately the, the reason that we all do events, however it fits into the communication strategy. Yeah, fantastic. Excellent. We might go around just one by one and just get your sort of final final tips for others that are sort of 
you know, feeling a little bit stuck or haven't run an event before or feeling a bit overwhelmed because they might be a much smaller organisation than, than Guide Dogs Australia and don't feel that they have the resources to do something, you know, as inventive and, and clever as this. Maybe just your, your final thoughts, your final, um, your final in, uh, encouragement to other organisations to, to be brave. Um, Charlie, what would be your final advice and tips? Well, look, I'm all for asking people what they want. So you don't always have to come up with the ideas yourself. Go to the people who you know love you the most and ask them what they want and feed them with, you know, all the lovely sweet stuff that they're craving. Um, and that's, that's exactly what we do. We never go out with something we haven't tested with, with some of our stakeholders. So yeah, you're not alone. You've already got people around you that will help you. Beautiful. Liliana? Yeah, I, I was smiling and agreeing because I totally agree with that. And um, it goes down to um, that example that COVID gives you the permission to connect with some of those key passionate donors and stakeholders who want to hear from you and they want you to ask them, what can we do together and what can we support? And if you're a smaller organisation, now is the time where you can even ask like organisations like yourself to say, hey, what are you doing and how can we work together? We don't have to be silos. No one's saying that at the moment. If anything, let's support each other. And when it comes to events and fundraising, it is already a crowded space. And we don't all have a beautiful puppy. We don't all have a beanie. We don't all have, a, you know, undies and great corporate supporters. I hear that all the time. But what you do have is passionate people who want to make a difference. And don't forget, be really, really clear on what that is and the difference that you want to make. And once you start going back to that original message of why you exist and the difference you make to those people who need you, you'll find that you can take it to another level. But just be really true to yourself and make sure you collect the data and you know communicate clearly. I, I think... And Charlie said it to us when we were talking um, about today. She said, give yourself permission. And we've been doing this with a lot of our clients. You can stuff up now. And people go, oh, yeah, it's technology. It didn't work. Or um, my child was about to run in. And I'm like, don't, don't. You know, that, that's okay. That's what we're doing at the moment. And it's keeping it real. So, yeah, it's exciting in a way. I know it's a bit of a challenging time but it's an exciting time to think what's new and the hybrid events are only going to grow and you're going to get bigger and bigger believe me fantastic and julie your final thoughts and then we're going to say goodbye to charlie in just a second um, my final thought i guess is really just make sure that it is part of your integrated overarching strategy you know, if you needed to you know if you've got a, a particular target for fundraising and you would not normally have held an event don't necessarily try and figure out how to hold a virtual event. You know, there's a lot of things that have got to be in place before you can actually make an, a, a physical event work, let alone a virtual event work in terms of a, being able to monetize it. And I know everyone's really struggling with how on earth they're going to be, but there are other sources of funding. So, you know, think laterally about it from that perspective. There's a lot more grant support out there at the moment from the philanthropic sector, for example, that's available potentially for organisations that would normally have you know, been, out, been expecting to raise their funding through physical events uh, and don't necessarily have the infrastructure to support uh, doing a virtual event. Uh, but my overarching point is though, just to make sure it's integrated with as part of everything that you do. You, you know, you'll see it, um, you'll see the follow-up communications from this particular session that we're running. You'll see that we'll make the recordings available. There'll be blog posts and, you know, just so the content that we've created here, we're going to be trying to make sure it gets out to as many people as possible, as widely as possible. It's the same things that really Charlie talked about as well, you know, leveraging the multiple channels that you've got for reaching your stakeholders and reaching your supporters. And if you don't have supporters, get right back to basics. If you don't have supporters, maybe your time's much better spent trying to just build the supporters and build understanding rather than, you know, in, in this point in time, rather than trying to fundraise. 
Yeah, fantastic. Great advice. Great advice. Um, well, Charlie, we're going to feed you, uh, feed you farewell. We're going to, we're going to feed you farewell as well as that one. <laughs> but please, could everyone just jump a note in the chat box right now? We would be giving Charlie a round of applause, so we're giving you a virtual round of applause. Thank you. Um, and just your comments in the chat box there. Uh, what did you take away the most today from the conversation here with Charlie about International Guide Dogs Day? Um, there's some beautiful comments coming through there. Thank you very much, Luke. Very inspiring. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Kirsty. Please jump a notes in there. Charlie's enjoying to see that. Um, huge applause all around. Love the key points. Now, don't disappear um, because we have some questions here and we want to hear your questions. Before we go, what is your burning question that we can help you with today? Charlie, thank you so, so much for coming on the show today. We've loved having you here and we look forward to sharing this much further and wider over the coming weeks as well. Thank you so much for the invite. It was, it was lo lovely to be part of this. And good luck, everyone. You got this.